Greetings. Uh, looks like most folks are here and we're ready to get started. So let me go ahead and pop open the share and I can duck him. Right. So first thing, um, I took a little vote on office hours with my earlier class today, and I wanted to continue that discussion with you guys and make sure we settle on some office hours. So um, they wanted the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one to two hour. Um, that's the hour pretty much right after I finish with you guys. Um, so that one is set. I am going to do that. And I just want to know, is there anybody who could not make the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one to two hour? Couldn't make it at least to one of those. I know some people got work right after this, stuff like that, other classes. Turn off the share. Right. Okay. Uh, so then for those people who cannot make the one to two office hour, is there anybody, so what I asked is, uh, is there anybody who cannot make the 1 to 2 p.m. office hour on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? If yes, then I would like to know some times that do work for you. All right, so if you cannot make uh, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one to two, I'd like you to, in chat or however, um, tell me a few things that could work for you. Any day after 2.15, any time from the morning to 1 p.m. So unfortunately, I have a, another long class right before this. Um, after one is good. Okay. Cameron says he could do any time after 2.15. Nicholas says he could do any time up through 1 p.m. Okay, so here's what I would like to do. Um, if you cannot make if you cannot make the one to two on Monday, Wednesday, Friday please send me a Canvas message. You only need to do this if you can't come to the one to two office hour on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But if you cannot come to this, please send me a Canvas message with at least three hours and I want days and times, which would work. Okay, and that way um, I'll have a, a bunch of different times from those folks who can't do this one. And I'll be able to add uh, a few more office hours to make sure everybody is included. Right, so I imagine that there are things like that. So if you have another class or if you have work uh, right after this, some classes I know are, are not meeting on a set schedule. Some of them are. Sometimes work schedules change. This is a dynamic thing and I'm, I'm willing to move these around and play with you guys. I'm just trying to establish a maximally efficient baseline right now. So um, if the one to two hour on Monday, Wednesday and Friday is not free for you, um, then please send me a Canvas message letting me know uh, three or so hours which do work for you. And by that, I mean days and time. So right right now, the office hours are gonna be Monday, one to two. 
Wednesday one to two, and Friday one to two. If you cannot make at least one of those every week, please send me a Canvas message with at least three office hours, which would work for you. Um, and then I will combine what I get from all of you guys and, um, and make sure that there is at least one office hour every week that uh, everybody can come to. Okay. So don't forget to do that. If you can't come to these, send me a message. We'll figure some more out. Um, any questions about the office hour stuff? So I will, I will post on um, Canvas. Uh, right now, when you go to our Canvas page, the home page is that syllabus page that has like my name, my phone number and stuff or whatever. Um, under office hours right now, it says TBA. What I'll do is I'll post a Zoom link right there and it'll be a standing meeting. It'll always be, um, it'll always be that same link. So anytime you wanna come to office hours on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday from one to two, just go to our Canvas page and click on the Zoom link next to office hours and you shouldn't have any problem. Alrighty. Uh, the other kind of thing I wanted to ask about or talk about before we before we dig back into the material is anybody having trouble with WebAssign? Anyone not able to get in to our WebAssign class? Um, even if you haven't bought an access code, you can get in. You just go through the WebAssign process as though you have an access code. And when they ask you for it, there should be a link somewhere on that page that says, you know, click here to use temporary access. Um, and that will be fine. Just make sure you buy an access code uh, within the two week grace period. So whether you bought an access code or not, please go ahead and get into WebAssign. There is a homework set there that is open for you and is due next Monday. So it's important that everybody's in there and everybody's working. Um, Rakib, what kind of trouble? Okay, so I will talk about, uh, about that in chat with anybody who has has trouble and we'll try to resolve it because I want everybody to get in there. I want everybody to be in there like now so that you can be working on that homework. The trick to succeeding in this class, like in most math classes, uh, is to start working the homework immediately, like right away, as soon as it comes out. And then every day after class, spend a little bit of time, an hour or two on the homework. If you do that, you'll be fine. Uh, you'd be amazed how effective that is. Uh, the longer you wait after class to start the homework, the more you forget. And so the harder the homework is to do, and then you get less out of the homework process. Um, so please, uh, I hope that everybody is in there and working on this stuff right away. Um, I, I did see that a bunch of people got in and got started. Some people are even almost done with the first homework. That's awesome, really proud of you. Uh, keep that up and, and you'll have a great time in this class. It'll all feel surprisingly easy. You'll be like, oh, I don't understand. What's all the, what's all the hype about Calc 2 being impossibly hard? It's not hard as long as you keep up with the homework. Okay, so let me grab some fresh paper. Today we are going to continue talking about um, integrals. That's a 10. That's a 10. That's a 7. Yeah, I don't want that. So let me see what else is going on down here. I need to apply the code under the course. I don't know exactly where that is. I just know the register code link is on the home page. That doesn't work. Hmm. Uh, so the main topics um, for this first week are, are kind of review things, right? Last time we talked about 5.5 and some kind of fun, sneaky substitution problems. Um, the other two sections that I want to cover this week are 6.1, which is on areas between curves, and 6.5, which is on the average value of a function. 
Um, both of those are pretty interesting. 6.1, hopefully you got a decent treatment of in your Calc 1 class, um, but I know that when I say things like that, there's always at least half the class that didn't. So we are going to go back and, and I'll, I'll cover that with you. Um, and then the other thing, average value, is a kind of funny concept. Um, it's not going to be relevant anywhere else in the course, it's just an application, but if you go on to take any advanced statistics, it will be very important. So, um, that is what we're going to talk about, and I think I'd like to start with just one more good 5.5 problem, one more good substitution problem to get us, get us thinking. So, So a little bit easy. Eh. Eh. Nothing wrong with easy, as long as it's fun. Let's do that. Yeah, sure, what the hell. Oh no, that doesn't actually involve any sneaky stuff with the differential. So we've done a lot of definite integrals. We haven't done any def indefinite integrals by a u sub. Let's look at one or two of those. And I think this would be a good example, yeah. Okay, so uh, last example from section 5.5, evaluate the indefinite integral. to the T so I want to evaluate this integral that is my goal um, my first question is can I cancel the two to the T's can I like cancel cancel like this and say that this is just the integral of one-third or one-fourth something like that no no, right? That's not kosher algebra because 2 to the t isn't a factor of the denominator. It is a factor of the numerator um, and it shows up downstairs, but it's not a factor. So I can't cancel because I cannot factor the 2 to the t out downstairs. So instead I'm going to have to do something else. Yeah, a lemur, a cute fuzzy kitty, or a wonderful teddy bear does die every time you cancel something you shouldn't cancel. It's true. It's true. Uh, so to avoid killing the cute things, um, we need a different mechanism to approach this problem. Um, and given that it's section 5.5, you can guess that the approach is going to involve a substitution. So here I'm going to let z, and I like to use the letter z for my substitutions instead of u, but if you, if you like using u, that's okay too. I'm going to let z be the denominator. because the derivative of two to the t is going to involve two to the t. Uh, you might not remember how to differentiate non-base e exponentials, other bases, they're a little bit different, and that's why I chose this problem, just to remind you. So the three, of course, is gonna differentiate to zero, so my dz is really just going to involve the derivative of two to the t. Does anybody remember how to differentiate like two to the x or five to the x, anything besides e to the x? e to the x is easy, right? He's his own derivative. Uh, but what about 2 to the x or 2 to the t like here? We have to find uh, the natural log of the base, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see a few different responses here. And actually, none of them are quite right. But many are very close. It will involve a natural log of something. It'll involve the natural log of the base, um, but we don't divide by it, we multiply by it. So the derivative of 2 to the t is 2 to the t times the natural log of 2. And then, of course, the derivative of 3 is 0. Uh, one way to get at this, I'll show you on a, on a separate piece of paper, this is kind of sneaky. If you have b to the t, you can actually write this as e raised to the natural log of b to the t, right? Because e raised to the natural log of some shit is always just that shit. And then you can rewrite this as e raised to the t times the natural log of b. 
using that rule that says powers can come down from logarithms out front. So if you want to differentiate that ddt of b to the t, that's the same as ddt of e raised to the t times the natural log of b. And then this is something we can differentiate using the chain rule. I heard somebody say that. That's correct. So the derivative of an exponential, uh, e to some stuff, is always e to that stuff. So that's e to the t times the natural log of b times the derivative of the inside. And here the inside is t times the ln of b. So the derivative of that is just ln of b. And then you can walk back through this little algebra game and rewrite this as e to the ln of b to the t times ln of b. And then e to the ln of some stuff is just that stuff. So that's b to the t times the natural log of b. So the derivative of a non-natural base exponential, derivative of b to the t is b to the t times the natural log of b. So with that in mind, this is my differential. I just need my dt here. And if there were limits, I would change those limits also, but there aren't limits. This is an indefinite integral, so that's all I'm going to need. Which means that my integral is equal, so the integral of 2 to the t divided by 2 to the t plus 3 dt is equal to, well, I've got the 2 to the t upstairs. Downstairs here, 2 to the t plus 3, that's just z. And so I can, I can see that this 2 to the t dt, that's right here. In fact, before I do this, let me, let me rewrite this integral in a way that will help us see exactly what it is we're doing. I'm going to write this integral as 1 over 2 to the t plus 3 times 2 to the t dt. Right? Having the 2 to the t upstairs is the same as having it outside the fraction. And then 2 to the t times dt, that's almost dz, right? So from this guy, if I divide both sides of this relation by ln2, I'll see that dz over ln2 is equal to 2 to the t dt. So this 2 to the t dt is the same as dz over ln2. And then this piece is 1 over z. So my integral is the integral of 1 over z times 2 to the t dt. Well, that's dz over ln2. Does everybody see where that, where that differential piece went? Now, the natural log of 2 is a constant. I can pop that out of the integral. We'll have a 1 over log 2 come out of the integral. Yeah, a few people gave the correct value of the antiderivative. Um, so this guy, I will pop my 1 over log 2 out. And then what's left is the integral of 1 over z dz. And then I need an antiderivative for 1 over z to evaluate this indefinite integral. Who differentiates to 1 over z? Natural log. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the integral of 1 over z dz is the natural log of the absolute value of z. So this is 1 over ln2 times the natural log of the absolute value of z plus a constant. Remember, when we do an indefinite integral, we always need to add that plus c. And when you solve problems like this in WebAssign, uh, make sure you use a capital C. They always want a capital C there, and it'll, it'll actually mark you wrong, I think, if you lose a lowercase c, which is irritating. Um, but that's the standard notation. Am I done with the problem? No, you have to put the 2 to the t times 3. Uh, you have to change the c to, uh, by the 2 to the t times 3. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so the ln of z, if somebody asked me, you know, what is the integral of 2 to the t over 2 to the t plus 3, and I turned around and said, oh, it's the natural log of z, they would be confused as hell because they don't know what z is. 
I have to go back and replace this by what z actually is. z is 2 to the t plus 3. So this is 1 over ln 2 times the ln of 2 to the t plus 3, all in absolute values, and then plus c. So that's my final answer for this guy. And with that, I think we've, we've spent enough time reviewing the substitution rule. Uh, so remember, in Calc 2, we absolutely require that you change your bounds when you do a definite integral. Um, no longer is it okay to not change those bounds or leave the bounds off or go back to the original variable at the end and evaluate between those bounds. When you make a substitution in a definite integral, please change your bounds. And when you do an indefinite integral, just be very, very careful. Never leave off the differentials. The dz, the dt, that shit is so important. It's, in some senses, the most important thing. Um, so it's, it's crucial that we develop correct and careful notation, which is why I'm happy to go back and spend some time at the beginning of the course. I know at the end of Calc 1, this stuff usually gets a little bit sloppy. It's usually done a little bit fast. Um, but in Calc 2, this is kind of the foundation level shit. So we need to be really on top of it. The next bit that I want to look at with you um, is section 6.1, which is on areas between curves. And hopefully you've seen some of this stuff before. That shouldn't be entirely new. Um, but, but, you know, there's been time to forget. Not every Calc 1 class gets to it, so that's okay. So we're going to talk about section 6.1, which is areas between curves. Um, oftentimes, when we're looking at integrals and area problems, we're thinking of it as the area beneath a curve. Uh, Fernando, the requirements for simplification are a little bit subtle. If there's an obvious or easy simplification, like uh, the sine of pi over 2 or the tangent of pi over 3, then I expect you to tell me what those things are. And if there's something that clearly cancels and makes the answer substantially simpler, I expect you to make that, that simplification. But in general, I'm not going to beat you guys too hard about simplifying stuff. Um, so that, that last answer that I gave uh, exactly as it is is fine. I wouldn't expect you to try and do anything with that, for example. Um, so in the area problems, we're used to thinking of them as integrals as giving us the area under a curve, and that's fine. But what if I have two curves? So maybe here I have some function f of x. And maybe here I have some other function, g of x. Uh, and I want to find the area between them, maybe from a over here to b over here. So I'd like to find this area. The book gives you a formula for finding that, but it's given in terms of absolute values and it's kind of weird. Um, so I'm going to give you, I'll show you that formula and then I'm going to give you a kind of alternate way of thinking about it. So the area between f of x and g of x from x equals a to x equals b, this whole mess. The formula given in the book is the integral from a to b of the absolute value of f of x minus g of x dx. And the purpose of the absolute value is to make sure that you're getting the right sign. Um, but how do you integrate an absolute value function? Does anybody remember that? This is a common problem at the end of Calc 1, finding the, the integral of like the absolute value of 2x minus 1 from negative 1 to 1 or something like that. The trick is you need to get rid of the absolute value. And the way you get rid of the absolute value is by figuring out where the thing inside is positive and where the thing inside is negative. And for us, that's going to mean who's bigger, f or g. 
So I'm going to take this interval we have here and I'm going to chop it at the point where these guys intersect. I'm going to call that C. For this specific example, the absolute value of f minus g depends on where you're looking. From a to c, the absolute value of f minus g is just f minus g, because f is bigger than g, so f minus g is positive. From c to b, the absolute value of f minus g is g minus f, because g is larger there. So here's how as the picture is drawn, you would, you would evaluate this area. This would be done as the integral from a to c of f of x minus g of x dx plus the integral from c to b of g of x minus f of x dx. Because that absolute value, we need to we need to get rid of him in order to actually evaluate the integral. I don't have any uh, like integral rules or anything like that for absolute values besides um, get rid of the absolute value. How do you get rid of the absolute value? You figure out where the thing inside is positive, and you figure out where the thing inside is negative. So f minus g is positive from a to c, so I leave it alone f minus g is negative from c to b, so I need to negate it to make it positive, which has the effect of changing the order of subtraction. Now the easy way to remember this is that you integrate upper minus lower. Now sometimes the functions can trade place, like in the in the picture I drew there, right? The function f started out on top, but then they swapped when they met. Um, so sometimes this is going to require breaking up your integral into two different pieces, and that's that's what I did there. Okay, so these are the kind of formulas that we need in order to find the area between two functions um, where y is given as a function of x. Sometimes we'll turn this picture sideways and let x be given as a function of y, and we'll see how to handle that also. Um, but this is the fundamental thing. If you mix up the top and the bottom, and they never change place, then you will end up with the negative of the correct answer. But if f and g swap places a few times, then it's possible that your answer will be incorrect and also something other than the negative of the correct answer. Um, so if f is always bigger than g, but you integrated g minus f, then you would get the negative of the correct answer. Um, but if, if you have a situation like this, and you were to just integrate from a to b, f minus g, then you would get neither the correct answer nor the negative of the correct answer, because you'd be getting this area correctly, but you'd be getting this area negative. And those two are going to add up to something other than the negative of the correct answer. That's a, a good question. So let's look at an example. All right, any, uh, sorry, any other questions about this setup? So then a, a fun example here is to find the area between sine and cosine from 0 to pi over 2.
Always draw the picture. All right, so if you're asked to find an area, you should sketch that area. It's very important. So I'm going to begin by drawing the graph of cosine from 0 to pi over 2. I know cosine starts off up here at 1. I know it'll eventually make it down here to negative 1. Um, and I'll mark off some points here. So let's call this, well, let's tell you what, let's call this pi over 2. So then this would be pi over 4. I know that cosine starts off up here at 1, and I know that he gets to 0 by the time we're over here at pi over 2. Uh, so the graph of the cosine function on this interval looks something like this. All right, and then he continues, of course, he continues down here, and eventually he makes it to negative 1, you know, something like this, all right? There's a half period for cosine, he continues. But I'm just interested in that first part. Sine, on the other hand, starts off at 0 and makes it all the way up to 1 by the time we get to pi over 2. So I'll do my best to draw this nicely. All right, there's that first quarter period for sine. And I know eventually he's going to make it back down. Something like this. Right. But so the piece that I'm looking for is just the area from zero to pi over two. So I'm looking for this area together with this area. This is sine x. And this is cos x. And pi over 4, of course, if you remember your unit circle, that's where sine and cosine are equal. So that's that intersection point. So from 0 to pi over 4, cosine is above sine. And from pi over 4 to pi over 2, sine is above cosine. So this first area, the total area, A, is equal to, you can think of it as being like A1 plus A2, where this is A1. And this is A2. Sorry, that one's a little hard to see, isn't it? This is A1, and that's A2. A1, the area that is between them from 0 to pi over 4, that's going to be calculated as the integral of f minus g, cosine minus sine. And you see how I always put my integrand in parentheses? If my integrand is made up of multiple parts separated by addition or subtraction, you need to put them in parentheses. This is another one of those notation things, right? In Calc 1, maybe nobody cared, nobody gave you a hard time about it. In Calc 2, we're going to give you a hard time about it. It's important. Um, because of the way that the differential acts upon the integrand, it's important that you're thinking of this dx as multiplying both of those. So please uh, use parentheses around your integrand. So that's A1, that's the area from 0 to pi over 4. I take the upper minus the lower, and the upper from 0 to pi over 4 is cosine, and the lower is sine. And then I'm going to add that to the integral that represents the area A2, which is the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 2. And now my upper is the sine function. So this one will be sine x minus cos x. And again, putting the whole integrand in parentheses because that's the way the differential term acts. Uh, neither of these integrals is especially hard. Antiderivatives for sine and cosine are straightforward, just like the regular derivatives are. So in my antiderivative step for this first integral, I ask who differentiates to cosine? Well, that's sine. 
and then I'm going to have a minus whoever differentiates to sine. Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so this is going to be minus negative cosine or just plus cosine. And that first piece I need to evaluate from 0 to pi over 4. So there's the antiderivative step for the a1 integral. And then the antiderivative step for the a2 integral is going to look very similarly. The antiderivative for sine is negative cosine. Antiderivative for cosine is sine. And this piece gets evaluated from pi over 4 to pi over 2. So first, any questions about the setup? writing down these two integrals, we see why those, those are what they are. And notice that I never even bothered writing anything about absolute values. There's no need to, right? The whole, the way you evaluate that statement with the absolute values is by splitting it up like this. And I think it's very intuitive to just jump straight to this. So I, I encourage you to do that. First, draw the picture, find any intersection points, and then set up the appropriate integral for the, the little areas. Having done this, I just need to plug in pi over 4 and plug in 0. When I plug in pi over 4, sine and cosine are the same. Um, they're both equal to root 2 over 2. So at pi over 4, this is root 2 over 2, this is root 2 over 2. When you add those up, you just get the square root of 2. And then I'm going to subtract what I get when I plug in 0. When I plug in 0, the sine of 0 is 0, the cos of 0 is 1. So this is going to be root 2 minus 1. And then I'm going to have to add that to what I get when I evaluate this piece from pi over 2 to pi over, or from pi over 4 to pi over 2. So in the second piece, when I plug in pi over 2, the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So this piece contributes nothing at the upper limit. The sine of pi over 2 is 1. So at the upper limit, I have negative 0 minus 1. So that's minus 1. And then from that, I'm going to subtract what I get when I plug in my lower limit. Uh, now, the cosine of pi over 4 and sine of pi over 4, those are both root 2 over 2 again. So this is going to be negative root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2. That's negative root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2, which is minus the square root of 2. Um, but we are subtracting it, so this is going to become positive. All right. So at pi over 2 here, I get negative 1. At pi over 4, I get negative square root of 2. And when I subtract that, negative 1 minus negative square root 2, that becomes negative 1 plus square root 2. So all together here, what do I get? I can combine my like terms. I have root 2 plus root 2, that's 2 root 2. Minus 1 plus minus 1, that's minus 2. Okay, so in other words, each of those two areas um, are the same. A1 is the same as A2. They're both root 2 minus 1. And when you add those together, you get 2 root 2 minus 2. Any questions on this example? I don't know why I got the second square root from the negative cosine minus sine of x of pi fourths, I got negative square root of 2. Yes, it is. And we're subtracting that. So here, I'll, I'll do that second evaluation piece out in a little bit more detail. I, I understand if that felt a little funky. So looking more closely, Thank you. 
So what is this? This is equal to negative cos of pi over 2 minus sine of pi over 2. All this minus negative cos pi over 4 minus the sine of pi over 4. We agree on that, right? Got it. I, I, I missed out one sign. And no worries. Yeah, there's lots of things here. The cos of pi over 2 is uh, 0. So that's 0 minus the sine of pi over 2. Is and then from that, I subtract the negative cos of pi over 4, which is negative root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2, like this. All right, and then when we combine those, we get the negative 1 plus the square root of 2. Okay, uh, so those evaluation steps are, are things that, that you'll get a little bit more comfy doing quickly in your head as we go on, but if you want to, especially at the start of the course, take your time writing them out like this, not a bad idea. Um, as a general rule, don't be afraid to waste paper, right? Waste paper, do it, do it. Um, the trees are not as valuable as the mathematics. If you want to use recycled paper, go for it. Um, but yeah, don't, don't be afraid of writing things big and, and taking up lots and lots of space. Um, it's one of the disciplines that will make Calc 2 easier. Fill the trees. Fill the trees. I like trees. I, I, you know, I, I'm an environmental But only to a certain extent. Mathematics takes precedence. Okay. So, let's look at one or two other area problems like this, and then we'll talk a bit about average value. The intuition for um, most area problems works great, just how we did it. Upper minus lower, you know, maybe you need to split up the integral. But sometimes you won't be given two functions of x. Sometimes you'll be given either an equation that might implicitly define y as a function of x or x as a function of y. Or maybe you'll be given two functions where both are functions of y rather than functions of x. Um, and I want to look a little bit at how to do that. So uh, the next example I'd like to play with is to find to y equals x minus 1 and y squared equals 2x plus 6. Now that first guy, he's easy to graph. He's definitely just a line. But that second guy is not super obvious. And depending on how detailed your study of conic sections was in pre-calculus, we might not even know how to graph that second guy. One way to graph the second equation there would be to take square roots. And then just remember that you get a plus and a minus when you do that. Another way would be to solve it for x, and then think of that as defining not y as a function of x, but x as a function of y. What do I mean by that? Uh, let me call this y1 and call this y2. The graph of y1 is easy to draw. That's a line with slope 1 and y-intercept negative 1. So if I mark this as uh, negative 1, then the graph of y1 just looks like this. But the graph of y2 is less easy to see. So here's what I would do. I would solve this for x. This is y squared minus 6 all times 1 half equals. Now if I, if I swap x and y in this expression, if I gave you 1 half times x squared minus 6, I think everybody could graph that. I think everybody would recognize that that's a parabola in vertex form, right, where the vertex is at 0, 0,6, and it's been squished a little bit by the 1 half. 
this is the same thing, just turned sideways. That's it. That's it. So this is a parabola sideways. If you y equals, uh, if you plug in, let me see, y equals zero, then what do you get out? Well, when y is zero, this is going to be one half times negative six, which is negative three. So when y is zero, x is negative three. So we've got this point, negative three comma zero. And what other points do I have on that graph? You could plug in x equals zero, and when x is zero, y squared minus six would have to be zero. You get plus and minus the square root of six. Those aren't super nice numbers. Um, but you know that plus square root of six, well, like two squared is four, three squared is nine, so it's a little bit bigger than two. So there's one, there's two. And so we'll have this point. Square root of six. And you'll have this point down here, which is zero comma negative square root of six. And so you've got this parabola. And again, my art isn't perfect, but something like this. All right. so here's the graph of these two equations. We did in less we're talking. If I hold up, so it's going to be one half times what minus three equals x. I subtract the six over, and I get y squared, and then I divide by two. You could write it as y squared over two minus three if you wanted to. You could distribute the one half, but I believe as I've got it written here is correct. Um, so take the steps, go through them slowly. Uh, you'll have y squared minus six, that's this. And then you want to put all of the same as multiplication by one. Um, I am going to take the executive action here of muting everybody by default. Uh, if you do want to unmute yourself, you can just unmute yourself. You can just... All right. Uh, yeah, so if you do want to talk, just go ahead and, and hold down the space bar to do so or type in the chat. Uh, the answer to Fernanda's question, I see why you would think that, um, but it, as it's written here, it is correct. And if you if you check carefully, you'll you'll see that. Um, oh yeah, I know I'm back. No worries. So I want to find this area, right? That's my task. But I don't have a clear upper and lower function. To the left of this point over here. This curve is both the upper and the lower. That's weird. And then over here, like between those two intersection points, the parabola is the upper and the line is the lower. But which part of the parabola do we treat as the upper and how would we get it? It's a little bit complicated. So the way you handle this is by integrating not with respect to x. It's not going to be a dx integral. It's going to be a dy integral. In other words, I'm going to think about my little Riemann rectangles as going like this. Rather than up and down, I think of them as being left and right. So this is going to be a dy thickness a little change in y, but then the height of that rectangle isn't really a height anymore, it's a width, and it's going to be this x value minus this x value. In other words, the area here, the integral formula we're going to use, we're going to integrate from y some y value to some other y value. Well, I'm going to write that as y equals a to y equals b to emphasize that they're y values. And instead of upper minus lower, it's going to be the right function 
minus the left function. And the integral is going to be a dy integral. So we need to express not y as a function of x, but x as a function of y. And then I also need to find these limits. I need to decide what is the smallest y value in my region and what is the largest y value in my region. The smallest y value in my region is the y value at this point down here. And the largest y value in my region is the y value at this point right here. So I need to find those intersection points and I need to solve both of these for x. Now I've already solved this one for x and solving this guy for x is easy. You just add one. So this is y plus one equals x. This guy is my right function because he's this line. This guy is my left function. He's this parabola. So I'm gonna integrate right minus left from whatever this y value is to whatever this y value is. But I need to find those y values. And in order to do that, I need to set these guys equal to each other. Everybody on board? This is a, a good moment for questions. So if you have questions, let's take a second to ask them here. Oh, I just chose to draw that re rectangle in right there. Yeah, there's there's nothing special about where I chose to draw this rectangle. I, I just, just picked a random spot in that region to draw the rectangle. Yeah, I could have drawn it anywhere else. I just wanted somewhere that I could highlight the right minus left and, and the fact that the thickness is now a dy thickness. So there's nothing special about the location of that rectangle, that bar. You don't need the rectangle there. Um, I think it's just helpful to emphasize that this length is coming from the value of the function here minus the value of the function here. That's all. So normally when you draw your little Riemann rectangles, right, you would have the top minus the bottom for your height. Here you're gonna have the right minus the left for your, your height. That's all but you don't need to draw that rectangle. Most people, when they solve this, uh, they would not draw the rectangle. It's just here to try and help you visualize what's going on. I don't recommend squaring the x minus one to try and solve because you won't lose information. You're gonna gain extraneous information. But the easier way to find these intersection points, now that I have both of these solved for x, is gonna be to set this equal to this. So to find And the idea is that since I'm thinking with a dy mindset, I'm thinking of y as being the independent variable, um, I would like to set these functions of y equal to each other rather than the corresponding functions of x. In fact, this first guy isn't really even defining y as a function of x, right? This thing fails the vertical line test. Um, so, so setting y plus one equal to one half times y squared minus six, that's the ideal way to go about this. So let's do that. Now, in order to solve that equation, uh, you might start by multiplying both sides by two. And make sure you distribute the two when you do that. So you get two y plus two equals y squared minus six. And then I can subtract the two y plus two over and I get zero equals y squared minus two y. And then I'll have minus six minus two is minus eight. And now I want to factor that if I can. Uh, so I need two numbers whose product is negative eight and whose sum is negative two. Um, coming up with those two, it's not terribly difficult. Two numbers that multiply to eight and add up to negative two. Those are going to have to be four and two, right? And since the two is negative, it's going to have to be, uh, since this two is negative, we're going to have to have this as 
y minus 4 times y plus 2. And that should work, right? So that means that my two y values are y equals negative 2 and y equals positive 4, setting each of those factors to 0 on their own. Questions about this step? OK, so that means this point right here is something, I don't care what, comma, negative 2. And this point right here is something, I don't care what, comma, positive 4. So I'm going to integrate from negative 2 to 4, this function minus this function. So my area is equal to the integral from negative 2. And I'm not going to write the y equals anymore. You don't have to write it. It's just there to remind you that these are y values. From negative 2 to 4 of my rightmost function, which is this guy, the y plus 1, minus the leftmost function, which is this guy, the one half times y squared minus six. And it is a dy integral. Okay. Yes, those are the bounds. What we just found were the y values of those intersection points. And the smaller one, negative 2, is the smallest y value anywhere in this region. And the positive 4 is the largest y value anywhere in this region. So I think about this bar as moving from bottom to top, sweeping out that area. That means I need to integrate this minus this from this y value to this y value. And that integral looks like this. Um, I'm not sure if you're having trouble hearing me, Kenneth. Um, maybe try turning up the volume. I am a little bit soft spoken, uh, but the mic that I'm using right now is a pretty good mic, so you should have some decent audio. Is anybody else having trouble hearing? I might be able to turn the sensitivity on this mic up a little. Audio microphone is using that one. Test the microphone, switch phone audio, audio settings. Speaker, microphone, here, yeah, I can boost the, I can try to boost the mic sensitivity a little bit there. Is that better? Oh, I see it's cutting out. Yeah, that's a bandwidth issue. I don't know if it's on your end or on my end. Okay, if you do have trouble hearing me, if there's ever anything that you miss and you want me to repeat something, just say so. I'm happy to do that. Um, but also the recording is being done locally on my machine here. So whomever's bandwidth is, is causing the problem, uh, once I upload the video to YouTube, the audio should be nice and clear. Maybe my neighbors just started watching Netflix or something. Okay. Uh, so questions about this setup. Is everybody comfy with how we got to that integral? This is the hard part for these problems and also the other chapter six stuff that we're going to do on volumes. It's important that you're comfy with the setup. Any questions about where that integral came from? The limits, the two functions, the dy, why they're subtracted in the order they are, anything like that.
So here, because we're looking at this kind of sideways picture, we solved both of the equations for x to get x as a function of y, which means we end up writing y's in here. So think of this as like f of y minus g of y. If the picture is an up and down picture, we would have f of x minus g of x. Uh, but since it's a left and right picture, it's an f of y minus g of y. Other thoughts, questions? Easiest time to ask a question is always right now, right when we're doing it in class. That way it'll, it'll be best for you and best for me. I can give you the best answer and you can internalize it best. So if there's anything else you're wondering about where this integral came from, this is the perfect time to ask. Don't be shy. I have a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. What the function was instead of y squared x squared x squared, then we will have to find dx, right? Yeah, if you had something like y equals 2x squared plus 6, then you would probably end up integrating that dx um, because that doesn't define x as a function of y. That only defines y as a function of x. Uh, no, that's okay. not two one. That's a six and a closed parentheses. Yeah, this parentheses is closing this parentheses. That's all. Hey, what else? Hold it. Yeah, okay. All right, it sounds like we're pretty comfy with where this is coming from, so let's do the simplification and integrate this thing. So that's the integral from negative two to four of, I can drop these parentheses. I need to distribute this negative and that one half, so that's gonna be minus one half y squared plus one half times six, which is three. All right, so just doing a little bit of algebra in there. And then I can combine the like terms, the one and the three. And you should always do as much algebraic simplification as possible before you do the antiderivative step. So I'll write this in standard form, negative one half y squared plus y, and then plus four, the one and the three. So this is what I'm going to integrate. Uh, y squared, these are all just power rule things. This is a polynomial, so that's gonna be y cubed over three. So that's gonna be a negative one sixth y cubed plus integral of y is one half y squared and the integral of four is just four y. I don't need to bother with a plus c because this is a definite integral. So I'm going to just evaluate those between bounds now. Any questions on the antiderivative step? Okay. So then when I go to evaluate, I'm gonna plug in four and see what I get. Four cubed is 64, so this is negative 64 over six plus four squared is 16, so that's 16 over two plus four times four is just 16. So that's what I get when I plug in my upper bound. And then I need to subtract what I get when I plug in the negative two. Uh, negative two cubed is negative eight, and this negative and that negative will come together to make a positive eight six. Negative two squared is positive four, so that's four halves. And then negative two times positive four is minus eight. So there's my evaluation step. And then I'll just combine all the things I can combine. Um, the positive 16 and the negative eight, that makes a positive eight. Uh, four halves is just two, so let's, we'll simplify things as much as we can here. 
64 over 6. 64 isn't divisible by 6. Um, so we'll just, let's see, what are they? This is divisible. They're both divisible by 2, though. So that's 32 over 3. Right? Yeah. 16 over 2, that's plus 8. Plus 16. Minus 8 sixths, that's the same as uh, 4 over 3. So I'm going to distribute this negative now. It'll become minus 4 thirds. Minus 4 over 2, that's 2. So this will be minus 2. And then minus minus makes plus 8. Uh, so let's see what we get when we combine all this good stuff together. I've got 8 and 8. I've got 16 here. So the 8 and 8 make 16, plus another 16 is 32. Minus 2 is 30. So I'll have minus 32 thirds, minus 4 thirds. Uh, and then everything else we said came out to 30, right? These two 8s make 16, plus this 16 is 32, minus this 2 is 30. So this plus 30. Now, 32 thirds and 4 thirds, that's negative 36 thirds. 36 is divisible by 3. Uh, what is 36 by 3? My brain. Uh, 12. So I'll we'll have 30 minus 12, uh, which is 18. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Any questions on this problem? So what we just found is that the area between those two curves is 18 square units. Okay, so I don't know if I can quite get everything in here at once. That's pretty close. Okay, so take a look at this. Take a look at your notes. Remember, it's very important that you write down everything that I write down here. So I will do my best to give you exactly what you should have in the notes. We should be able to go back and explain any one of these steps. So imagine that your buddy is missing from class today and you had to explain it to him or your grandma really wanted to know how to find the area between these curves. You want all the detail in your notes that you would need in order to explain that to her. And so Nas asks, do we need to write square units at the end? Mm, nah, I don't really care. I mean, if you're a physics student, then yes. Uh, if, if we're talking about something where, where there are units of length given, like if each unit of length along the x-axis was one inch, then I would want you to say 18 square inches. Um, but in this setting where we don't really have any units and we're just talking purely mathematically, I'm okay with you just saying the area is 18. Um, but do know that areas are measured in square units, volumes are measured in cube units, and so on. That's okay, Lucas. So uh, one of the nice things about doing this online is that you can rewatch the video after the fact. So something that I liked to do when I was taking classes like these is I would take notes on printer paper like this during class. Um, and then afterwards, I would take those notes and copy them down, but with all the little things that weren't quite there or weren't quite perfect fixed in a notebook. So my recommendation is that you take notes on, on some paper. I don't care if you use printer paper or whatever, but take notes during lecture and try to write down every single thing I write down. But if you end up falling behind or you have to skip a step or something like that in order to keep up with the pace of the lecture, then afterwards go back and watch the video on YouTube and then you can create kind of a master notes list in a notebook where you have everything nice and organized. That would be my recommendation. It's a very good way to study. Um, Questions or comments on the problem? Anything that we're curious about? Okay, then I'd like to look at, we have time for one more, I think. I'd like to look at one more. Yeah, most math classes are two notebook classes, it's true. Um, I'd like to look at one more problem where things aren't quite as clear. 
So I think on this problem, it was pretty clear that we needed to do a dy integral. And on the previous problem, it was, it was pretty clear that we needed to do a dx integral. Um, so let's look at one where it's not so clear. I want to find the area bounded by x times y equals 1, y equals x, uh, and y equals 1 fourth x. So here I'm, I'm given three equations. Each one uh, has a graph. But they can all be thought of either way, where x is a function of y or where y is a function of x. So it's not entirely clear at the outset how we should express this as a dy or dx thing. Um, my suggestion, draw the picture. So x times y equals 1, that's the same as y equals 1 over x. That's the hyperbola. y equals x, we know that's a line through the origin with slope 1. And y equals 1 fourth x, that's a line through the origin with slope 1 fourth. Okay, so here is my admittedly not beautiful, but reasonable drawing. And you should draw these big, right? Notice I'm, I'm taking up lots and lots of space with this stuff. You should too. Draw these nice and big so you can tell exactly what's going on. The two lines both go through the origin and the hyperbola never touches either axis, but has those horizontal and vertical asymptotes. <clears throat> this point right here, where y equals x and y equals 1 over x intersect, that's the point 1 comma 1. This point right here, where y equals 1 fourth x and y equals 1 over x intersect, what is that point? Where is 1 over x equal to 1 fourth x? Ah, well, so that's the question here. So are we going to end up setting this as a dy integral or a dx integral? Um, you could do it either way. That's true. This is a problem where you could, could work either way. Before we worry too much about that, let's go ahead and find this other intersection point. We know we're going to need that no matter what. Um, so to find this intersection point down here, I need to set this guy equal to this guy. Um, now remember that this guy is the same as 1 over x. So to find intersections, we need to solve 1 over x equals x, and this means that x is equal to 1, and that's going to be this 1 comma 1 point. The other one we need to solve is 1 over x equals 1 fourth x. Um, so how do we solve this second guy? I'm sorry, uh, one fourth x like this. Yeah, x is upstairs there. If I multiply both sides by four uh, x, then you see that this is really equivalent to. When I multiply by four, I get four over x equals x. Multiply by x. I get 4 equals x squared. Um, so here, x has to be 1 of plus or minus 2. I know that I'm looking for a positive solution here. Same this. This has solutions plus or minus 1, but I took positive 1 because I know I'm in the first quadrant. 
Here, I'm going to take the positive solution because I know I'm in the first quadrant again. So this is two comma something. Uh, and the something, the y value there, um, is one half, right? Because it's on the graph of one over x. It's also on the graph of one fourth x. If you plug in two to either of those, you're going to get one half. All right, so those are our two intersection points, one comma one and two comma one half. Yeah, good, good. And then the question is, do I want to solve this as a dy problem or a dx problem? I want to find this area. I know that this point over here, of course, is zero, zero. I know the other two intersection points. Um, and you could do it either way. If you're going to do the dy setup, then you need to do two different integrals. You're going to have to split it here. Because above the line I just drew in, this is your right function, and this is your left function. And below the line I drew in, this is your right function, and this is your left function. If you want to do it as a dx problem, you have the same issue. To the left of the line I just drew in, this is your upper, and this is your lower. To the right of the line I drew in, this is your upper, and this is your lower. Let me do the dx setup. I'm going to integrate from the smallest x value in my region to the largest x value in my region, the upper minus the lower. But because the upper and lower change, I'm going to have to do the integral from 0 to 1 of this minus this, plus the integral from 1 to 2 of this minus this. So that's the integral from 0 to 1 of what is my upper function here? It's y equals x. And my lower function there is 1 fourth x. And then the integral from 1 to 2, my upper here is 1 over x minus my lower here is still 1 fourth x. Everybody see where that's coming from? So you can do this either way. You can do this as a dx integral, or you can do this as a dy integral. Because you have to split it up either way, there's no real reason to prefer one or the other. Uh, and neither integral is difficult, right? It, it's hypothetically possible that maybe the dy setup would lead to a harder integral, or the dx setup would lead to a harder integral. Here, neither of those is true. Um, x minus 1 fourth x, I can combine those before I do the antiderivative step, so I should. That's 3 fourths x. Plus this guy, I can't combine anything. That's the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over x minus 1 fourth x. So 3 fourths x integrates to 3x squared over 8. I'm going to evaluate him from 0 to 1 plus 1 over x integrates to the natural log of the absolute value of x minus and then 1 fourth x integrates to x squared over 8. And I evaluate that piece from 1 to 2. All right, so this guy is a power rule integral. I increase the power by 1 and divide by the new power. So that becomes an x squared. And then I have to divide by 2. That makes the 4 downstairs into an 8. Here, 1 over x has natural log of the absolute value of x as his antiderivative. And this is another power rule integral. I increase the power by 1, so make makes it an x squared. And then I divide by that new power. Again, I get a 2 times 4 downstairs. gives me an 8. This first piece. If you plug in the lower limit, you get 0. So the only contribution is from the upper limit. And when I plug in x equals 1, I just get 3 eighths. If you want to, you can think of that as 3 eighths minus 0. And from this second piece, at the upper bound, I'll get ln 2 minus 4 over 8. And then when I plug in the lower bound, I'll have ln 1 minus 1 over 8. What is this? 
What is the ln of one? Uh, zero. All right. So then I'll finish this up on a rendering page down here. So from that first piece, I have my three eighths. I have this three eighths plus ln two. Four eighths is one half, so minus one half. And then minus minus makes plus one eighth. Uh, and I can combine the rational numbers. Um, three eighths and one eighth make four eighths, which is uh, one half. Oh, that's nice. Um, so this is just the ln of two. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that's good shit, right? Okay, so um, this is where we're going to stop for today. On Friday, I'm going to talk a little bit about average value. Um, so you may know how to take the average of a set of numbers, right? If I want to take the average of two numbers, I add the two numbers together, then divide by two. If I want to take the average of 5,000 numbers, I add all the numbers together and then divide by 5,000. What if I have infinitely many numbers? Hmm, that's going to require an integral, and that's what we will talk about in section 6.5. And that particular concept of average um, is going to require uh, a little bit of careful thinking, but it's super useful in statistics. It's also useful when you're trying to find things like the center of gravity for a, for a physical object. I see, why don't we have to put the two in absolute value? You can. Um, you can call it the natural log of the absolute value of two, but the absolute value of two is just two. Um, so that it wouldn't be incorrect to write absolute values here and here. That would be fine. It's just that um, the absolute value of two is two and the absolute value of one is one. So the absolute value will go away. All righty. Um, so I am going to have an office hour after this. Give me just a little second to get that meeting set up. Um, and while that is going, I will start to uh, process the video and get it uploaded to YouTube. If you guys have any questions, don't be shy about asking. Uh, and then I think we got a full attendance list yesterday, but if before you leave, you can please just type here in the chat. Um, that way I'll have good attendance records for these first few weeks. So please go ahead and do that and then um, feel free to sign up. I right, hope you guys have a lovely afternoon. And uh, if you want to come to office hours, I will um I will be there for the next hour. All right, let's get that office hour meeting set up. Is a recurring meeting. No fixed time, but I can't say when. Oh, okay, we'll do it like this Monday, Wednesday, Friday, repeat every one week. End date. And it's going to be August 7th. Uh, Zoom should be pretty much sorted now, right? Okay. Um, yeah, Ryan, if you have a question uh, from the homework, I would be happy to talk about that in office hours. I'm configuring the office hour meeting in Zoom right now. Give me about five minutes to get it posted. Um, go to the Canvas page for our class, and then, um, then in about five minutes, just refresh that Canvas page, and you'll see the link there. Uh, Zeander, did you want to ask something before we sign out? All right, 
if you do, if there's anything you want to talk about, just come over and meet me in the office hour meeting here in about five minutes. I am going to end the meeting.